You asked for it, you got it. The grudge rematch of the century, Japantown Smackdown, part two, featuring four all new battle rounds. Will San Francisco hold on to its championship title? Or will San Jose pull off the biggest upset in this rivalry? We'll find out right after this. In this epic battle, we pit two of the last remaining Nihomachis or Japan towns left in the U.S. And they happen to be neighbors. And in this corner, weighing in at an impressive six city blocks, our reigning champion, San Francisco, Japan town. San Francisco used to have the largest Nihomachi outside of Japan, but it was wiped out when Japanese Americans were detained in World War II. It was revitalized in the 60s when these three shopping malls were built. Today, it's mostly a commercial area. And in this corner, the challenger at two city blocks, smaller, yet hardier and spunkier, San Jose, Japan town. This crosstown rival flourished with neighborhood mom and pop businesses in the 50s and 60s. Nowadays, it's aging with the population. Will it have the vibrancy to overthrow a reigning champion? Let's find out. Round one, Chien. For this round, we're gonna bend the rules a little bit and go outside of the actual Japan towns to visit two Bay Area botanical treasures. Located in the Golden Gate Park is the famous Japanese tea garden, or Chaniwa. These gardens are usually pretty compact and designed mainly for visitors to enjoy scenery while they're sipping their tea. The Japanese tea garden was designed and created by gardener Nakato Hiragawa for the 1894 World Expo here in San Francisco. After the expo, he oversaw its modification into a public park, and his family was allowed to move onto the grounds and serve as caretakers until World War II when they were removed to Japanese internment camps. The Hagiwara spent a small personal fortune cultivating this into spectacular grounds, and they often imported in a lot of plants and structures directly from Japan. Water is a central feature of Japanese gardens and represents both the ocean, which dominates Japanese life, as well as the process of purification. Waterfalls specifically help wash away bad spirits and fortune. This taikobashi, or drum bridge, is the most talked about feature here, mostly because it's pretty difficult to get over. Higawara adapted this from the Chinese moon bridge design, and it's meant to look like half of a taiko drum. And when you see it, along with its reflection, it completes an entire circular taiko. There's a small tea house here that's also a remnant of the World Expo, and you can stop in here for some traditional refreshments. For today's contemplation, I've got crunchy Arare rice crackers, some hot roasted hoji cha, and did you know fortune cookies were popularized here? It's still included with your food order. Just down the street from San Jose's Japantown in Kelly Park is the Japanese Friendship Garden. It was built in 1965 to commemorate the friendship between San Jose and its sister city in Japan, Okayama, and is modeled after the world-famous Karakuen Gardens in Okayama. Much like Karakuen, this place here used to be gorgeous and was a setting for weddings and events. Unfortunately, the adjoining creek flooded the lower grounds at the end of 2017, so it's still undergoing repairs. There's two main reflecting pools that are central to the design of this garden, and they're kind of drained and look pretty ugly. They'll probably remain this way for several years until the city decides how they want to re-architect it. But let's go in and see if we can imagine what it's supposed to look like. Much of the materials and plants were donated by the city of Okayama, although the actual garden itself was built by volunteers from the Japanese Gardeners Association here in Japantown. You'll see around here there's a ton of these ornamental stonework, which um, are hundreds of years old. This water lantern is in every Japanese garden and typically represents the five elements earth, water, air, fire, and spirit. The first thing that you'll get to is this red arched bridge. Red is a lucky color in Japan, and bridges are a pretty major design element in Japanese gardens. They represent the transition that you go through when you're passing from the moral realm on one end to the spiritual realm on the other. 
Usually they're crossing over to something. In this case, we're going over to Tea Ceremony Island. Islands are another major design element and can either represent the islands of Japan or religious islands where deities reside. Bridges can also be flat stones or wooden platforms. And a zigzag one, which is meant to confound evil spirits because they can only walk in a straight line. Look out for the islands built on the backs of turtles. These are sacred places for gods to land when they come and visit you in the garden. And there's all sorts of nooks and crannies where you can hide away and meditate. So come and sit for a while. If not for the flooding, it would be San Jose all the way for its peace, tranquility, and lack of people. But at this point in time, point, San Francisco. The tea garden is super charming and I love being able to stop in for some snacks at the tea house. Round two, sushi. Did you know that modern sushi was first eaten as fast food? That's why all these sushi joints are bars so that you can gobble and run. The pieces are perfectly bite-sized and the correct way to eat them is not with your chopsticks, but with your hands. So you just pop them in your mouth and chew. Oma San Francisco Station is the epitome of the classic sushi bar. The small eight-seat counter restaurant is located in the Kanukuniya building, right next to Anderson Bakery in a small nook in the back. As unassuming as this restaurant may seem, it's actually listed on the Michelin Guide. The service is omakase style, oma for omakase, in which you specify the size of your order, five, eight, 12 pieces, and entrust the chef to prepare the freshest nigiri for you. Pair a glass of their boutique sake. This is a local small batch brand. Today, Chef Wilson-san is preparing the five-piece nigiri and hand roll set. We start with a kurodai, a black sea bream shipped from Greece. This is so beautiful. It's lightly smoked on the top. Oh gosh. So sea bream is normally kind of oily, but this has this really beautiful buttery taste to it. The iwana, an arctic char from Iceland, seasoned with bitter orange salt. Wow, that's delicious. Slightly warmed and super soft. There's a little teeny bit of salt on the top, which accentuates the sweetness of the fish. There's a little bit of skin on the top, which gives it a really nice brininess. Magro, a Spanish bluefin tuna. This one is one of Chef Wilson's favorites. So good, guys. The Aji, a wild horse mackerel from Nagasaki, is subtly infused with ginger blossom. Very springy, very turgid. You would expect an overwhelming taste of fishiness, but it's a very clean taste. Kanpachi, a wild amberjack from Kagoshima, is first aged for six days. This is a classic. And finally, the Toro Takutamaki, a chopped bluefin tuna hand roll with pickled radish. Love the little bits of tapiko in here for just a little bit of crunchy texture. For a traditional finish, a tasty dashy broth made with fish stock, laboriously simmered for six months. Overall, a divine experience in under 30 minutes. Okay, so my selection here in San Jose was a little limited. The restaurants down here tend more towards family-style comfort food. I'm here at Sushi Maru, which is one of the only pure sushi bars in Japantown, and it is always packed with locals. There's a selection of conveyor belt sushi for express service, but they also have a pretty extensive menu and a ton of specials on the wall. I would look at that. This is not fancy sushi, so the prices are quite reasonable. It's very fresh, but the quality is only about average. What I love is the variety, which can't be beat, and they often import in fish directly from Japan. So I ordered a couple of specials off their wall. This is a king crab sushi with mayonnaise and roe on top. And a salted marinated halibut, also called barami, that's shipped from Japan and raw scallop or hotate, and this one is from Hokkaido in Japan. I'm gonna start with the king crab. That was pretty delicious, although I'll have to say it was a big mouthful of mayo, so that obscured the taste a little bit. This piece of halibut is already pre-marinated, so I shouldn't have to season it with any soy sauce. Mm, that's a really interesting flavor. It's very lightly salty. Among other culinary treats, Hokkaido is also very well known for its scallops, so this should be the absolute one. Mm. 
the rolls here are more like half orders. I only got three in mine, but that's perfect because then you can sample a little bit more variety. They also do some great cooked fish, and this one is a black miso pod. Oh my god, that's so delicious. And I love that combination of sweet and salty, and there's that awesome ocean umami. 37 bucks? Not bad for how much sushi I ate. All right guys, this round is super difficult to judge. For around 35 bucks, I got two completely different experiences. Sushi Maru is a great deal for very decent fish, but I'm gonna have to give it this round to Oma SF Station. For $30, you're getting top shelf quality, exotic cuts, white glove service, and you're out of there in under 30. Point, Oma SF Station. Round three, matcha. The latest hot foodie spot here in Japantown is Cafe Matcha Maiko. This is the third location here in the U.S. and franchise owner Chris Chen just had to bring a branch of it here to the Bay Area when he visited in Honolulu, Hawaii. And it was a super smart decision as the place is so popular there's frequently a line wrapped around the corner. They serve all matcha all the time. Their signature dessert is the Maiko Special, a matcha soft serve with jelly, red beans, cornflakes, a piece of matcha chiffon cake topped with mochi balls and candy chestnuts. I also got one of their matcha drinks so we can do a head-to-head -head comparison. The matcha used in all of their products comes directly from Harima Gardens in Uji, Tokyo, where matcha originates and is of the highest grade. The lattes here are served ice. I love that bright grass spring color to it. Wow, that flavor is intense. It's very cold, very creamy, and it finishes with that kick of matcha to your face. Okay, there is a ton of sugar in here, which offsets uh, that bitterness from the matcha. Overall, pretty refreshing, and I'll be sucking this down like a milkshake. Right in the heart of San Jose's Japan town is Roy Station Cafe. For such a sleepy street, it's surprisingly busy all the time. So it's not Japanese per se, and you will find your lattes and your chocolate croissants right next to your matchas and your barbecue pork buns. This property was purchased by Roy Mitsoni, a immigrant sharecropper from Japan, and he opened it up as a gas station and American diner, and you can kind of still see the bones of the gas station in this building. Well, he had to close it down in the 1990s, pretty much sat empty for about 20 years until his grandkids resuscitated it as a cafe. And it's still got some really cute retro touches like this old tiny gas pump. I ordered a green tea latte. This design is so beautiful and it took her so long to do. I almost don't want to drink it and ruin it. Delicious. This latte is so well brewed and that foam milk really takes the edge off that bitterness from the matcha. And they finished it off with this nice thick head of foam. And even though I didn't add any sugar into this, the pumpkin design actually uses a little bit of chocolate. So there's a little teeny bit of sweetness to it. I love all the locals just hanging out behind me here. Super fun people watching. This round was super close. And despite the vibrancy of the matcha at Matcha Maiko, Point has to go to Roy's Station Cafe. My latte was refined and I love the homey neighborhood environment. Next. Round four, Super Matcha Do. The true sign of an honest to goodness Nihomachi is a solid supermarketo or supermarket serving the locals. On the corner of Post and Giri is a huge Nijia market. This is a pretty accessible chain with about 12 locations throughout California and Hawaii. This one here in Japan town is on the larger side and pretty well stocked. So people are always asking me where to go to get fresh fish for sushi here in the US. This is where you go. They've got all types of fish, octopus there, squid, got a surf clam here. This is fresh wasabi. We grow this one here locally in Half Moon Bay. Okay, check this out. There's literally two whole aisles dedicated to snacks. This uh, GGE brand is one of my favorites. These are kind of like little broken up pieces of ramen that they season and then you can just eat it like this. The side is all the candy. Love these. These are Japanese style gummies. They're a little bit more firm than the European kind and you've got all sorts of unique flavor. Pineapple, melon, lychee, apple. Most of the produce sold here is grown on Najia's 100-acre organic farm in San Diego, where the store was first started. 
San Jose does actually have a Nijia market in Japantown, but since we've already covered this in the city, we're going to extend a few miles to West San Jose and Mitsuo Market in the very Japanese Strawberry Park shopping mall. Let's go in and check it out. Mitsuo has, I think, about 11 supermarkets all throughout the U.S. They only got this one here in the Bay Area, and it's huge. There's this stores within a store concept. Inside are small shops selling Japanese pickles, books, videos, beauty products, and a food court. Okay, one way of really measuring the worth of a good Japanese supermarketo is by their prepared food section. And Mitsuo has got three separate displays. Check this out. Sekihan, omurice, spaghetti, giant bentos, this one's hamburger, steak. There's a whole selection of side dishes. We got burdock here, the octopus, and roast pork over here. Sushi looks fantastic. This is so wild. There's a whole aisle of Japanese appliances back here. I have never seen so many varieties of rice cookers before. Okay, if you want to do yakiniku at home, they sell the indoor grills. This one here is for shabu shabu. And they always have these special food fairs. This week, they're featuring foods from Hokkaido. And the winner of this round, I have to give it to Mitsuwa. They are like the Amazon of Supermarketo. They got groceries, produce, small appliances, makeup, videos, you name it. Yeah, there's only one location, but it's definitely worth a trek down. And in our final tally, San Jose wins two rounds and San Francisco wins two rounds. It's a tie. That was a hard fought battle with both Japan towns bringing their best foods and attractions. But I think we've reached the end of the line on this rivalry. What say you next time we bring this south to Los Angeles? Let me know down in the comments below if you'd like to see a North South Smackdown. From San Jose, it's Zine signing off. See you next time.